uh, wrap up this Hot Topic Sermon Series. Uh, somebody said to me last week, they said, uh, I bet you're going to be glad when this Hot Topic Sermon Series is over. And uh, I said, well, you know, it's, it's not been too, too rough, but it, it's a tough, tough thing to, to navigate some of these issues. And um, I'm, I'm glad to be able to address these, and I think the church, we, we've got to talk about these things. Um, we've got to have conversations not just from the pulpit, but these conversations to really think through as Christians, how are we to be faithful to what God has called us to? And a lot of, a lot of tough issues, and I have not hit every top, hot topic, and uh, when I ask you somewhere down the road, too, if there are other topics that you would like to, to see uh, addressed, perhaps from the pulpit, um, feel free to share those with me at any time as I work on preaching planning. Um, I am, I'm willing to tackle whatever. So I'm, I told you at the beginning when I first got here, as far as I'm concerned, there's no topic. Uh, that's that's off the table. Uh, we can we can address whatever we need to address, and the church uh, and Jesus Christ has something to say about whatever issue uh, life brings to us. So, all that to say, uh, I wanted to say this too as I begin this hot topic to address the, the issue of abortion. Uh, my wife mentioned a verse to me, and I shared this actually a couple weeks ago with you in, in Romans, um, in Romans chapter eight. Nothing can separate us from the love that is found in Christ Jesus. Nothing can. And as I think about these hot topics and think about those who maybe have wrestled with uh, the issue of homosexuality or same-sex attraction, those who have walked through the pain of divorce and just the brokenness, regardless of the reason of what happened, um, for those who have just wrestled with the topic of war, military service too, and just some tough questions that might rise up in, in addressing these, and for those perhaps who, who have address the issue, have lived through the issue of, of abortion, uh, it, is, it is good news that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. No action, no past sin, no past area of brokenness, nothing can separate us from the love that is found in Christ Jesus. And that's good news that we have to experience ourselves, but good news that we have to offer to this world. Uh, and I want that to, to frame even the message today as we think through this. Uh, many of you, maybe you've, you've seen this in the news or it's been on CNN, it's been on Facebook too. Uh, Emily Letts, you maybe know this name from New Jersey, 25-year-old woman who decided to have an abortion uh, to, to help remove the stigma of abortions. And so this happened just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, if, you, if you have not seen this, you can just... You can look up on any of the news, news websites, too, and you'll find the story. Uh, Emily works at an abortion clinic in New Jersey, and so she counsels women um, before they have an abortion. And she thought, I've never experienced this myself, so how can I offer counsel to women who are making this decision to abort? And so she decided, I'm going to make a video, and I'm going to have an abortion myself. And so she videos her own story of going through the process of having an abortion. And she says in the video too, it is not a graphic video by the way, I was a little nervous, I thought, I don't know that I really wanna watch this video. It is not a graphic video, but there's footage where she's actually in the, in the room with the doctors as they are performing the abortion. But it's just a picture of her face and having conversation. It's just a very uh, interesting video. It, it, makes, it makes it look like it's, this is not, it's not a big deal. And that was my experience of the video. And Emily, at the end of it, she's reflecting on the fact that she gets this abortion, and she says this. She says, it's been a month now, and I don't feel guilty. I don't feel bad for what I did. I don't feel guilty. I knew that this decision was right because it was right for me. And that's the way the video ends. And in that, in that time frame, too, she says this one line, too, and we'll talk about this. She says this, I'm amazed that I can create life. Really? I am, I'm amazed, too, that we can create life. I'm amazed at that. I'm amazed that we can destroy life, too. I'm amazed that we can do certain things and make certain decisions. And yet, as I heard her, it wasn't such an over-the-top video. It was just she was really trying to help those who are walking through the tough decision of an abortion and asking this question, too. Should a woman have to feel all this guilt and shame over a really tough decision anyway? And her point is this. You shouldn't feel guilty. You shouldn't have to feel bad. 
And of course, she works in an abortion clinic, so she sees, sees this day in, day out for the, the previous three years that she's been working there. And I, this is not about bringing judgment, because I want to say this. If Emily Letts walked into our church, how would we treat her? What does it mean to be the body of Christ to her? What does it mean to be the body of Christ? It makes us a whole lot of uncomfortable, and yet we know in the depth of our hearts we should embrace her with the love of Christ Jesus. Should we not? It does not mean that we don't speak truth and love to a believer, but someone who doesn't even profess Christ and who maybe is even searching, how do we as a church embrace someone like that? Do we embrace them? Should we embrace them? Nothing can separate us from the love that's found in Christ Jesus. That's the good news that we have to offer to a broken world. It's the good news that every single one of us, I'm hoping you have encountered it in a very deep, deep way. Because when you've experienced the depth of the love of Christ, you realize, too, no one is outside of the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. If he could reach me, if he chose to save me and forgive me, he can save and forgive anyone. And in fact, that's why Christ died for the whole world. Because he's deeply in love with every single human being, regardless of their past, regardless of their present. We serve an incredible God. And he makes us uncomfortable sometimes. And his call to love others is really uncomfortable at times. Welcome to Christianity. Welcome to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing with this abortion issue. I want to I start with this. There's two slides that we've addressed the last two weeks. When we think about how to address abortion, we've talked about this. We can start in a few different places. We can start with reason. We can start with experience. We can start with tradition. Or we can start with scripture. You can start in a few other places. But these are four pretty broad categories. And what I've been saying these past four weeks when we think about these hot topics is this. If we are Christian and serious about our walk with Christ, we have to say this. Scripture is our primary voice. <laughs> It is our primary authority. Scripture is what we call our canon, meaning this, it is our measure, measuring rod. It is our rule. It is what we live life by. So anytime we have a conversation about any of these issues, we've got to ask ourselves as Christians, what does Scripture have to say? Because you can get into all kinds of arguments on the topic of abortion with people who do not share your faith, and you find out you're, you're not even working with the same authority. And so when you are working with Scripture and they're not, well, there's a, you're just going to do this all day long. You're just going to butt heads. Guess what? Two Christians who even use Scripture do this a lot too. Because we look at Scripture and we read it differently. And we interpret it differently. That's why there are 41,000 denominations around the world. One of the reasons. We can't even agree on our use of Scripture. We can't agree on our interpretation of Scripture. But we find out too there's a broad umbrella called Christianity that... Just because we disagree with the Baptists on certain things doesn't mean that they're not brothers and sisters in Christ. Just because the Presbyterians or the Episcopalians or the Catholics or you name the denomination, just because they look at Scripture a little bit differently doesn't mean they're not a Christian. And it, is it possible for someone to be a Christian and be pro-choice? Um, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. And here's the thing. There are Christians who say they are pro-choice. And then, that, then you start saying, oh, how can you, how can you, how? And you start to learn to see, okay, they're, they're coming from a different perspective too. They're coming from different experience. But here's the thing. We say scripture is our measuring rod. It is, it is our rule. So here's the thing. What does scripture have to say about the issue of abortion? Anybody? What does it have to say? It doesn't address it. Okay, this makes it really tough now. We got a hot topic that it doesn't actually address the specific of abortion. Here's Richard Hayes. This is the one resource I've been giving to you all four weeks. This, is his, this has helped me. He's kind of been a study partner for me, professor at Duke Divinity School. He says this. It is significant that the canon, though it does not address abortion specifically, portrays a world in which abortion would be not so much immoral as unthinkable or unintelligible. All right, so let me translate that for you for a second. The scripture does this. It does not address the issue of abortion. It's not in the categories of, well, here are all the sins. Thou shalt not have an abortion. Okay, it's not in the Ten Commandments. 
It's not in the list of Paul's rules in 1 Corinthians to say, how are we to conduct ourselves as Christians? It's not a question of morality in Scripture. It's not a question at all in Scripture. Because in Scripture, it's completely not in their worldview that the abortion would even be a topic that anybody would wrestle with. Does that make sense? That's not even a conversation they were having in biblical times. It's a conversation we have today because, well, we have the option now. We have the option. And so this is tough when you talk about Scripture to say, well, where do we go to in Scripture? And you've got to at least be fair to Scripture to say, it does not specifically, explicitly address the topic of abortion. But we can say reasonably, it implicitly or indirectly addresses the topic of abortion. So where would we go? Let's, let's keep going here. What, is, what's, what Scriptures can we go to informing a Christian response? And this is probably by far, if you... Are you aware of any of the debates that Christians have had, even with non-Christians or Christians with Christians? This piece of, uh, of Scripture in Psalm 139, this by far is the dominant passage of Scripture that people go to when they are addressing this topic. Okay, so Psalm 139. Let's just read it together. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were made for me, were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now this passage is, is very interesting too. We'll, there's a comment that Hayes makes that I want you to see here with me just a moment. What we get to understand in the Psalms too is this. In this psalm in particular, the, the primary statement that the psalm was making is a statement about who God is. All right? So this psalm was not written to say, how are we to think about the topic of abortion? Let's write Psalm 139. That was not what the author was doing. So we've got to understand what's the function of this psalm. Yes, it's to praise God for God's foreknowledge, that he knows us even as we're being formed in our mother's womb. He knows us even before any of our days come to be. So we see that God is a statement about God's knowledge of us that is completely way back there, too, from the foundations of the earth. Scripture will make that claim. He knew your days before they even came to be. He knows the words before they even come off your mouth. Okay, so this statement is about who God is and about God's knowledge. So let's look at this quote. Such statements cannot be pressed as a way of making claims about the status of the fetus as a person. Rather, they are confessions about God's divine foreknowledge and care. God knows and calls us not just from the time of conception, but even before conception, even from before the foundation of the world. Once we see that this is the tenor of Psalm 139, 13 through 16, we recognize that its bearing on the abortion issue is very indirect indeed. So he's trying to make the point too to say, don't misuse scripture when you're having a conversation and you're having a debate with somebody. To say, start trying to throw scripture to say, well, here are all my scriptures to tell you my view on abortion is the most biblical view. He said, Hayes' point is this. It's a dangerous thing to try to start using scripture to prove your point about this issue. But these passages of scripture can inform us to give us a theological view about how you think about this. What would God have to say about this? What does God have to say about life, period? Okay? Let's keep moving on. So where else can we go in the Bible? This is another passage, uh, Psalm 127. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. So great, there's a great memory verse for you. Here's the biblical worldview. It's a good thing to have kids. Bunches of them. Bunches of them. And when someone gets pregnant, guess what the response is? Joy. Excitement. And Hayes, we'll see a comment here. There's no sense of pregnancy is a problem. When someone gets pregnant, no one is like, what am I going to do about the baby? There was no panic in scripture about that. How am I going to tell my parents? What am I going to do? There is not that. It is a reason for joy. It is a reason for joy. So let's keep, let's keep moving along. These stories too. There are many stories in which men and women long for children. In such stories, news of pregnancy is welcomed by women with prayers and songs of joy. Genesis 21 the birth of Isaac, right? What's Isaac's name mean? Laughter. Because it was really funny. Because they were really old. Abraham and Sarah. 
They were, yeah, Abraham, he's 100. She's in the 90s, you know, you're thinking. Now, how many of you would welcome that? You who are in your 80s and you found out you got pregnant. How much of you would say, that's really funny, God. Really, really funny. So if I hear of any stories, Isaac is a great name. Great name to name your child, okay? It means laughter. So it's songs of joy. The birth of Isaac, the birth of Samuel in 1 Samuel. Guess what? All these women, Sarah, Hannah, in the book of Samuel, they're all barren. They can't have kids. And they have children in their old age. And they shout for joy when the Lord gives them the gift of children. And then you've got the great story in Luke chapter 1. This is when you got another old couple by the name of Elizabeth and Zechariah. And they're in their old age too. And then all of a sudden, Elizabeth finds out she's pregnant with John the Baptist. And she's an old woman too. And everybody's excited. Can't believe I'm having a baby. And I'm this old. And yet it's excitement and it's joy. That is the biblical worldview. That's the response. When children show up on the scene, when babies show up on the scene, it's a reason to, to give joy. So never do we find narratives that represent pregnancy as a problem. Let's keep going. So where else can we go in the Bible? Now we can, we can go to a lot of different places to talk about this. But I think this verse in particular is, is an incredible statement as we think about life in general. So John 1 starts, all things came into being. And John 1, 3, all things came into being through him. Referring to Jesus, who is the Word. And without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. And this statement in John, and this is, you're going to, I'm going to give you a few quotes too from Richard Hayes, which they just were, they challenged me, and I think they'll challenge you as well. But the point is this life comes from Jesus Christ, period. Life comes from. And regardless of how someone gets pregnant, the life that is there, life comes from God. It comes from Him. Okay? So listen, I want to show you a few quotes here. And we'll wrestle with these for a minute. Wherever new life begins to develop in any pregnancy, the creative power of God is at work. And Jesus Christ, who was the original agent of creation, the Word who was in the beginning, has already died for the redemption of the incipient life in utero. Which means this. Anytime life is formed in the womb, Jesus Christ has already died for that life. His grace and forgiveness is already, it's already there. It's already made available for the life that has been formed in the womb. And this statement, I mean, this is a deep theological statement to say, it doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter when even a miscarriage happens. That life Jesus Christ died for that life too. Already. And many of you, many of you, most women have walked through the tough journey of miscarriage as well. And it is, it is just a tough, tough journey. And if there's anything that I, I was reading the story of a woman who said this, there's something that helped me when she had a miscarriage and she actually had an abortion as well before she came to know Christ. And later in her life, she just lived with the grief Primarily more from the abortion, she had grief from the miscarriage too. But she said when she made the decision to have an abortion, she lived for years with just this guilt and shame. And a Christian counselor met with her and said, well, what's the baby's name? What was the baby's name that you aborted? And she said, I, I never named the baby. And she said, we'll give him a name. And so she named him Matthew, which means a gift from God. And this was a woman who walked a tough journey, and it was something so therapeutic for her as a Christian, too, to say, that baby, I chose to have an abortion before I, got, before I came into Christ, before I was married. But at that point, the guilt and shame was removed from Jesus Christ and the grace that said, even that baby, even that life was a gift from God. And these are, these are incredible stories. As, as you read stories, as you hear stories of, of women's tough journeys, family's tough journeys on making these decisions. Let's keep going. As God's creatures, we are stewards who bear life and trust. To terminate a pregnancy is not only to commit an act of violence, but also to assume responsibility for destroying a work of God, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. Now this right here is a, this is a tough statement. This is a tough statement when you say, what actually is happening in the act of abortion? That a work of God is being destroyed. Because life comes from him. 
Life comes from God. And this is tough too when we say, well, so what do we do with some tough circumstances? We'll get there in a moment. But this is making a simple theological statement of this. To abort, to terminate a pregnancy is to destroy life that has been formed by God. <coughs> Keep going. The normal response to pregnancy within the Bible's symbolic world is one of rejoicing for God's gift. Even when that gift comes unexpectedly, to understand ourselves and God in terms of the Bible story is to know that we are God's creatures. We neither create ourselves nor belong to ourselves. Within this worldview, abortion, whether it be murder or not, is wrong for the same reason that murder and suicide are wrong. It presumptuously assumes authority to dispose of life that does not belong to us. Man, being a Christian is tough sometimes. When we start saying things like this, I have rights. Guess what? That is not a Christian response. Everything is a gift. I don't have a right just because I'm a human being. I have privileges and graces that God has given to me. And I live as a good steward of the gift that God has given me. And my body is not my own. It has been bought with a price. And the life that is in me is not my own. It has been bought with a price. And my body and my life and every other human body out there has been bought with a price. It is not our own. And so when the debate out there in the world is, well, it's about women's rights, it's about the right of the baby, that, why are we even engaged in that as Christians? It's not wrong to talk about that stuff, but when we talk about a Christian response, we are stewards of the bodies that God has given to us. Any life is from God, and we are called to be a good steward of the life. Okay, let's keep going. So what's our response as a church to Christians considering abortion? Now this question, this response that I'm giving to you too is this. This is not addressing every possible scenario. But when we talk about one of the primary reasons too, our primary few reasons is usually it's an economic decision. I can't afford to raise a child. I can't afford to do it. I can't care for it. So when a young girl, for example, gets pregnant at 14, and then she's got a tough decision to make, and she has to make a decision, well, I can't even raise this child. What do we do with this? I can't afford to. And we know this. Richard Hayes, he doesn't even get into the adoption conversation, but that's a real, obviously, a real solution, a Christian solution to, hey, I can't even afford to raise this child myself. He doesn't even go there, though. He just says this. He puts the burden back on the church. <coughs> To say this, when a girl gets pregnant, for example, she can't afford to take care of this child, guess what the church's response is? We're going to help raise him. We're going to step alongside and say, we're going to carry the burden with you, and we're going to help raise this child and raise you because you're still a child. And when the church says, <laughs> we're not going to do that, Richard Hayes will say too, and I think I agree that's just a sign of the church's unfaithfulness to be who the church is supposed to be. If the church is not willing to come alongside those of us who stumble and trip up for whatever reason, if the church does not meet us with grace and redemption, well, is the church not missing what the church is supposed to be doing? This is a, t this is a tough call. There's a story that Richard Hayes says to, he uses the story, he said in California, there were a group, he says this, what's going to make a bigger response? A group of 10,000 Christians who who go outside of all the abortion clinics and hold up protest signs and say, no, no abortion, we're against abortion. Or is there a stronger witness when 10,000 Christians in Southern California go to the government and say, we will take any unwanted baby and we will raise them and we will take care of them. And when Christians go and say this to the government and to go wherever they go to say, we will do this, we will be the church for all of those unwanted pregnancies. So we'll take care of them. We'll assume the responsibility. And his point is this. If the church is going to do that, how much greater of a witness is that to the world? What, that's that's an incredible statement to the world. Much more than protesting abortion clinics. And I don't know what he's calling us to exactly, but I just know this. He is calling us to open our arms wide open in grace, in healing. And saying it does not matter why anyone chooses. If they choose to get an abortion, how are we going to respond? With love, with arms wide open. For someone who gets pregnant and they don't know what to do, our response is arms are wide open. We're going to journey with you through this. 
We are going to help share the responsibility because we know this is a tough journey and you've not been called to do it alone. So the body of Christ is there for it. These are tough. Because it's easier to just say, well, how do I feel about this issue? I'm against it. Okay, well, what are you going to do about it then when something happens? What are you going to do about it when a crisis pregnancy happens? Now what's the Christian response? Let's be ready. Let's ready to journey with them and say, we will share the responsibility with you. Because we believe that that life is a life that happened because it's the creative work of God that's at work. And we do not want to see that life destroyed or ended. We want to say, we want to see this life come to full abundance. It's a tough call on the church. Let's keep going. So what about extreme circumstances? And this, these, are, these are tough questions right here. So what if the life of the mother is at risk? So then you have the conversation, you have the decision to make. It's either the mother lives or the baby lives. And then what's the Christian response? Which life is, which life is more important? Guess what? There's no, there's no scripture to go to to say, one life is more important than the other. And this is where the church comes in to say, this is not just, a, it doesn't have to be just a decision from the woman or just the woman and the man. This is a decision that the Christian community makes together to say, we're journeying with you. We don't know if there's a right or wrong answer on this. I don't know that there's a right or wrong on that. One life is more important than the other. It's to say, through a lot of prayer and a lot of support of the community of faith, we're going to journey with you. Whatever decision that you end up making, we journey together with you, and we're going to support you through this. The tougher question, I think, too, is this. What about the pregnancy from what happens when somebody gets pregnant because of rape or incest? I hate that we even have to ask this question. But we do. What do we do with this? How do we counsel a girl to say, well, no, 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 you need, to, you need to make sure you need to keep that baby even though it was the product of rape? And we say, I, I, I don't know. We make the claim at the same time, oh, this is God's, God's life is at work here, and yet, are we going to ask someone to carry that burden too to say, this is a constant daily reminder that you live with of some tragic act of violence that happened <coughs> towards you. And the same thing even with incest. When a family member is the, the one who impregnated a girl. And you say, what do you, what do, you do with that? And these are, these are tough questions, and I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't have an answer for you. My answer is this, God's grace is enough. God's grace is enough. That we as a community of faith journey together and make some really tough decisions together too to say, we're looking and searching for God's wisdom here. We're looking for the Spirit to prompt us to say, you know what, this is a tragic thing that happened. God did not want this to happen to you, but God can even redeem that life that is developing within you. But should you choose to have an abortion, we're going to journey with you in love. And this is tough. And this is where I want to say, well, Scripture, why didn't you give us some verses on this? Why don't you give us something to lean on? And then that's where the incredible work of God is this, lean on me. Lean on the Spirit, because the Spirit still speaks. And the Spirit is active in the community of faith, and the Spirit gives wisdom and discernment in making tough decisions that the biblical world didn't even have to address. But that's the dynamic of the Christian faith. And it's a radical, radical call that we have. Last, last slide that we have here. Our response. And this is, there's just a few words that came to my mind too as I was praying about this. If this can't be our response, we're missing it as a church. So anyone who's had an abortion, regardless of the circumstances, the response of the church should be compassion and love. Period. We should be a community of grace <laughs> community of healing. We should be a place that truly offers genuine community to someone to say, if you name it, whoever walks in here into our church building, it doesn't matter what their story is. We are arms are wide open to them to say, you are welcome here. And the love of Jesus Christ is here. It's made available for you as well. And we are going to show that love to you. 
and we're going to journey with you no matter what your pain, what, no matter what your brokenness is. And I mentioned to you, this is the, to be a community of grace and to be a community of truth at the same time, we don't shy away from speaking truthfully in love. But for someone who's walked through this tough journey, let me, they don't need us to tell them and remind them what God has to say. They don't need one more dose of shame and guilt. Just so you know, that's wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. I've known that for every single moment of every day since I made the decision. And we as a community of faith need them in grace and love to say we are the hands and feet of Christ to you. And this, it's great about this, this goes for any issue. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the scarlet letter is on us. It doesn't matter our secret sin. The response of the church is to be the same. And I hope if Miss Letts walked into our church building, that we would meet her with our open arms, wide open. Wide open. There's a statement in your bulletin. If you want to pull that out just for a moment. I'm, there's nothing that I'm going to highlight in particular. But in your bulletin, one of the inserts, is a statement um, that the Nazarene Church makes. And I think it's a, it's a great statement, too, that, that kind of helps us point to a little bit of the tough dissension, too. But we as a denomination, if you ask, are we pro-life? Am I pro-life? Yes, I'm pro-life. God's pro-life. We're always pro-life. But we say things, too, when there are church, tough circumstances, too, to say, how do we navigate this as, as the church? Is abortion ever appropriate? Is abortion ever a Christian response? In the event of rape or in the event of incest or in the event of the mother's life is at risk, so it's a mother or, or a child's life. And I'm going to say as a pastor, maybe? No, maybe? I don't. And this is me. This is where we've got to pray about it. We've got to seek the Lord. We've got to seek the Spirit and say, Scripture doesn't give us a specific verse to go to. But the Spirit says, come to me in prayer. And if any of you lacks wisdom, ask for it. And I will give it to you. James. Read the book of James. If you lack wisdom, ask for him. Ask for it from him, and he will give it to you. What I want to do is this. this, this I want you to just take that with you. The Nazarene statement, though, I think it's just a good reminder for us to say, and yeah, where do we stand on this? We obviously affirm life. We affirm, affirm the sanctity of life. And we also affirm this, that we are going to be a community who offers compassion and love, a community that offers grace, a community that offers healing to anybody for any reason. Because that's what Christ would do. Nothing separates us from the love that is found in Christ Jesus. We're going to pray, and the church is going to play some music in the background. And my thought is this. If, if there's any reason you want to pray at the altar, um, if this issue in particular, if any of you have been affected by this, a family member, if you know someone, a co-worker, and you say, hey, they're wrestling with this question. And you have the opportunity to just be a witness for Jesus Christ. That you bear good news. And maybe this time of prayer is just to pray for that person. It's to pray for that life that is developing and someone is actually contemplating whether or not let's go through with this or let's terminate his pregnancy. Because we work with them. They're our neighbors. They're right here in this building. And we have an opportunity to extend the grace of Jesus Christ to, to whoever that is. And for any of you who have the pain from walking through this journey yourself, may you hear the good news today. Nothing separates you from the love that is in Christ Jesus. His grace is there to love, to forgive, to bring healing to a broken heart. And that's made available to anybody regardless of whatever they felt in their lives. But I want to give us just a few minutes, whatever you, whatever you want to pray about. If you want to pray at the altar, I invite you to. If you want to pray right where you are, we're just going to spend a couple minutes in prayer, and then we'll close together. But I don't know. I don't know what God's saying to you, but let's just pray together.
anytime I think about it for very long, it, it just blows my mind how much you love us. Lord, I pray for women who are right now in an abortion clinic making a decision. That you wrap them with your grace and your presence. That regardless of the decision they make, they know there's a God who is deeply in love with them. But God, if there's any sense too that they're deciding and they're weighing the options, may you speak to their hearts right now. May you remind them of the life that is in them as a creative work of God. And for those who make the decision to abort, or may you meet them where they are in their pain and their brokenness. And may you wrap them with your arms of grace and love and remind them that you are their Heavenly Father and they are your child. And may you Give them a community to wrap arms around me. They give them a community known as Christians to, to, to find them out, to seek them out, and to love them, and to walk with them through pain. Lord, for those who are sitting in here who have maybe walked through the tough journey, God, I pray that they would just be reminded of your incredible grace that not only forgives, but grace that just brings a healing and a wholeness to our hearts and to our, to our minds and to our lives. May we be a community of grace and a community of healing. May we be a community committed to praying for those who, who are struggling to make these tough decisions. But we, may we always be a community who points to you, the author and sustainer of life, the creator. And we want to be faithful to give you praise. Lord, thank you again for your grace. Thank you that nothing can separate us from the love that is found in Christ Jesus. Lord, we need your help. We need your spirit to give us wisdom. Give us discernment how to be Christians in this world when there are a lot of hot topics out there that we don't have all the answers to. But we know, Lord, that your spirit is more than able to speak truth, to speak grace. And Lord, may we just be tools. May we be available. May we be tools in your hand to, to speak and communicate good news and grace to this world. We love you and we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Before I dismiss you, just as a reminder, 